A big male thresher is a, is a small migratory songbird um, that breeds here in the Adirondack Park and in other areas of the northeastern United States. Not uh, brightly colored brown, tend to be kind of mottled. Um, it's a small forest songbird that spends a lot of its time, as I mentioned, in the understory. It has a beautiful song, as do all of the, the thrushes. They really only breed in the northeastern U.S. and southeastern Canada, and really only on high elevation mountaintops. Um, at this latitude, they really only breed above about 2,800 feet. And its breeding range is, is quite restricted, and we actually have a very significant part of its global population right here in the Adirondack Park. So it's a fairly narrow band, and it's, uh, it's dominated by balsam fir, and that is the zone where Bicknell's thrush and a few other species um, are, are found. It's not easy to traverse by human standards at all. Um, and you know they have a different way of getting around, but it's very thick, um, you know, stuff to try to get through, and and that's what they like the best. They found a niche, an ecological niche that that works for them. The bird likes to be in a place that is subject to wind, um, ice, natural disturbances like uh, fur waves and other things like that. So it's very adapted to what is normally for us a, a pretty disturbed habitat anyway. They just use little islands of. Um, mountainous vegetation for their breeding range. We think of these birds breeding here as our birds, but really they're only spending uh, three, maybe four months here at the most. They're spending the bulk of their annual cycle in another place, which in the case of the Bicknell's thrush is the Caribbean. Birds leave their breeding areas like Mount Mansfield or Whiteface Mountain in about the uh, latter half of September. They pretty much go down the east coast and strike out from roughly the Carolinas over to across water to the Caribbean. It takes them, I would guess, anywhere from two to three weeks. Their wintering range is also very restrictive if they really winter on um, a few islands in the Caribbean, primarily on Hispaniola, which is the Dominican Republic and Haiti. Which is mostly high elevation um, cloud forests, a very different habitat type to these conifer forests. These are broad-leafed forests. They're also at high elevation. They're cool, they're wet, they're, they're very dense vegetation, and that's where the Bicknell's thrush reach their greatest densities. And so it is a bird for which conservation actions, even in a very small space like uh, the Adirondacks, and in particular on Whiteface Mountain, can have a disproportionately large effect on its global population. A group of the nonprofits that have been engaged in this project have created a fund through the Adirondack Community Trust. We're trying to take the energy and the interest in conservation of the bird's um, habitat overall and direct it to its wintering grounds where really the socioeconomic condition doesn't permit large-scale conservation efforts, trying to protect both ends of the bird's migratory range at the same time. For the purposes of this study, we were in a unique position to get a better handle on what happens with um, how Bicknells are impacted before and after uh, development took place. Each summer we have employed a small field crew to conduct um, a series of point counts. The points are spaced so that there's quite a distance between them so you don't have duplicate observations of the same bird at multiple sites. We conduct point counts, which are sort of 10-minute observations on existing trails, on trails that the locations where the trails were proposed and now the trails have been constructed. And then a number of our control points are located in fur waves, which are um, natural phenomena of dying trees and regenerating trees. It's a very dense, brushy um, habitat type. We have a goal of being at the points um, in a narrow window of time very early in the morning which when Bicknells are most sort of traditionally and, and consistently active. We're listening for Bicknells, thrush, and, and a couple of other focal species, but we'll note whatever we see here when we're up there. We're in a unique situation in New York in that we've decided as a state to protect a huge amount of land for the Adirondack Park. The future of the Adirondack 
summits is really going to play a big role in the future of um, how Bicknell thrush thrive, especially in a changing climate. but really climate change is, is the number one threat for them because their distribution is so limited. So these forests are very specialized. They only occur at these higher elevations on these islands of habitat, which are mountaintops. So they have a restricted wintering range and a restricted summering range, and that makes uh, anything that's gonna happen you know, really important. You know, Bicknell thrushes are one of the few birds that are able to eke it out up here. If you live on a mountaintop, there's really nowhere to go as, as sort of the, you know, we've, we've seen in, in other studies, um, hardwood trees are kind of creeping up mountainsides, um, birds are moving in latitude, they may or may not be moving in elevation, but once you're at the top of the mountain already, there's nowhere else to go. I think that how we steward the Adirondacks, how we take care of this place and think about the needs of species that are really on the cusp of um, being in real danger says a lot about who we are as, as people and, and what our relationship is to the natural world. You know, we are the example of the experiment in conservation where we, we attempt to live and, and on this landscape in ways that, that aren't unduly harming um, the natural inhabitants of the region. We're really, you know, one of the largest forested, continuously forested um, areas in the eastern United States. And, and if you look at, at us from any sort of aerial satellite imagery, you can see we're really a green island in, in a sea of a lot of other development. I think it's important for us to think about how we manage our landscape for birds and for other wildlife because they are important indicators of a lot of things. It's a unique opportunity and you know, we're proud to be able to play that role in the Adirondacks to really provide the science that will enable us to make good decisions about how we care for this place.